Hello, everybody. This is another session of the Wizards of Ox Live. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Tonight, for me, <laughs> Garza in Brussels, that's right, it's midday for most of you. Uh, but tonight, we're going to be talking about what is it that could get you into oxlet risk territory? What, what are the things that you could, you know, you see your friends doing or you've done yourself, you're not even aware that you've done yourself, that would get you into um, trouble and would get you into having some symptoms and you wouldn't be able to necessarily recognize them as oxalic. So I think this is going to be a really interesting session. The four wizards are here. So we have in Toronto, Monique Attinger. Well, not today. Today oh, I'm coming right. from Charlotte, North Carolina. <laughs> that's correct. She's traveling. <laughs> so we have Susan from Dallas. She is in, in her library. And Carla from Colorado. I'm uh, Patricia and I'm in Brussels, like I said, and we're just going to get uh, started. Thank you so much for joining. If um, we are recording right now, so if you can just, you know, turn off your uh, camera and then at the end of the session, if we have a few minutes, then, you know, we can just invite you to have some cameras open and then we can have like a little chit chat with all of you. Okay, welcome. Do you want to share the screen, dear? I will be happy to do that. And I'll just remind everybody that this is for educational purposes. We want you to be as informed as possible about oxalate and what it could mean for you. Um, but whenever you're dealing with your own health issues, please consult with your trusted health practitioner and we'll try to keep you as educated as possible so that you can work with that person in as efficient and effective a way as possible. Absolutely. So um, do we want to, well, I'll get started. So yeah. what could set you up for oxalate problems? So what are those things, you know, I posted in the group because some, some people, you know, were like, okay, why, why would this happen? And let's just go back to the very basic. What is oxalate? And it's just a good reminder for everybody. Oxalate is a chemical that it's either made in our body or it's found in plant foods. And the most important thing is that it accumulates in our body. If we absorb it, our body doesn't have a natural way of dealing with it. So it's going to try to put it away wherever it can find, like a, it does the least damage. And in its accumulation, it may cause trouble in your body. And it will cause trouble in your body for a number of different reasons. And that's what we're going to be talking about. And it's just to get, you know, a baseline for everybody. It's a pro-oxidant. That means that it causes oxidative stress. So it's uh, inflammatory. So all those places, all those questions when it says, I did this and I'm hurting and I did that and it's sore and I did this and, you know, it doesn't feel quite right. Those are, those are responses that are inflammatory and they irritate tissue, especially if it was a, a place of a previous injury. I talk a lot about how when I was a teenager, I injure my right foot when my point, you know, from my, my ballet point shoe gave way and broke. And I always found it very funny that I would hurt there. And it was a super old injury, you know, 15, 20 years ago when I, when it started hurting again. And, uh, and that is something that we hear very often. Susan talks about her ankle that, uh, you know, that it was, um, it was sore for a long time. And it was when she started dropping the oxalates that that pain went away, apparently on its own, but now we know it's not on its own. There is always an explanation about why those 
funny things or unusual things happen. So the other thing that oxala does is that it ties your body's minerals. So Monique always says that oxalate has preferred dancing partners. When it's an when it's when it's a salt, it's already linked with that mineral, and that means that's going to be those crystals that are going to get and cause inflammation and pain everywhere. When it's still active, it's looking like Pac-Man for different minerals. And you could be in short of a particular mineral because the oxalate is gobbing it up or actually keeping it unavailable. So that would be your magnesium, your calcium, your sodium, your zinc. So uh, just be very much aware, your iodine for your thyroid. So many times we might start showing some symptoms in the thyroid. And it's actually because my iodine levels are low because the oxal is making it unavailable for our body to use. And um, the other really big thing is that it interferes with the traffic between the inside and the outside of the cells through the cell membrane. You have to think of it like a, like a border, you know, and there's things that go out and there's things that come in and they go through a border control. And um, it, uh, when you have oxalate, it's like if you have one of those smugglers that it's taking things in and it's taking the place of things that should go in or things that should go out. So um, it's that traffic is being interfered. And of course, you need those intakes in the cell and you need that garbage out of the cell. And if oxalate is just staying and not allowing this correct movement from inside and outside the cell, then it's a, it's a problem. And, uh, and I already said about the crystals that actually cause pain and discomfort. And a lot of it, it's not very specific, which makes it a very tricky thing to do because you might be hurting today in your foot and tomorrow it might be your thigh. And the other day is your elbow. And you're like, what is this? Well, it could be that accumulation of crystals in different places. You know, so. I would like to add something in because uh, in the year 2002, and that was after a lot of your doctors were trained, so they haven't heard about this, but there was a discovery that completely changed the way we understood that our immune system worked and it, it's a, an organelle called um, an inflammasome and it recognizes different things and then turns on a, this big inflammatory response. Well, what we didn't know is not only microbes like bacteria and viruses and fungus and stuff like that can trigger it, but also crystals. And so uric acid that causes gout can cause that, but also oxalate can cause that. So what it does is it turns on this kind of inflammatory state that has all these downstream things happening and is using a lot of your body chemistry trying to organize all of that. And so that's why um, it can cause more global problems because it's actually getting your immune system in a hyper state. So um, that can be involved with all sorts of things like autoimmune disease and things like that. And one I wanted thing. to just throw in one more thing. Sorry, we're all, we're all thinking of more things here. Um, Oxalate is really getting into places where the cell transporters can traffic it. So it's not necessarily benign that your body puts it in one place or another. It's not necessarily accidental either, because it depends on these cell transporters. And you think of the cell transporter as having a kind of ending so it can pick certain things up. 
And if that ending is appropriate to both sulfate and oxalate, then if that cell transporter goes out from the cell looking kind of like one of those machines for kids where they can pick up a toy and you've got this little crane and it can find things in the mass of toys. But if it's looking for a sulfate molecule and there's lots of oxalate molecules available and that ending fits, so to speak, it can pick up oxalate almost in a case of mistaken identity. So we've got this We've got this problem where a cell transporter not isn't really expecting to find lots of oxalate in the interstitial fluid around it. It's expecting to find the nutrient that it needs. Um, but if we're taking in a lot of oxalate, then there could be more available. And then that cell transporter is essentially having an oops experience of picking up the wrong thing and pulling it into the cell. Well, I've spent a lot of time in graduate school studying sulfate because sulfate is used for a lot of purposes in the body, but a lot of those are regu regulating hormones and regulating neurotransmitters and uh, uh, all kinds of signaling kind of molecules. And so when your cells are saying, I need more sulfate, they're actually going to be providing more of these transporters on the cell surface to take it in. So there's a reason that they're doing it. They're trying to accomplish something, but yet because you have this really high oxalate level, instead of just admitting the sulfate that it's saying I need, it's gonna be admitting this inflammatory stuff called oxalate that's gonna really tangle with a lot of the chemistry. And so it's a matter of substitution. Yeah. And this is why um, it's probably a bigger issue if you are dealing with an infection or something else that is putting you in, into an inflammatory state, because that's when your body's gonna be saying, hey, I need more sulfate. And that's when you're gonna be moving that oxalate into places maybe that it's not welcomed. Well, the other thing that we need to remember it is that oxidative stress, one of the, the things that it does is deplete your B vitamins. And we already know that B1 and B6 deficiencies can lead to endogenous production or in a massive increase in endogenous production. So that's also something to, to keep in mind that what happens when you have that oxidative stress, you know, the down chain, you know, effects are, can be pretty bad. Yeah. And for those of you who don't have more information on oxalate, but would like to have more of this more general information, we have a mini workshop on our YouTube channel and I'll make sure that that'll be down below in the notes. Absolutely. So now that we know what oxalate is, you know, and the kind of damage that it can do, then we're going to say, okay, how can we get in trouble in oxalate? And why hadn't I never heard about it before? You know, why is this like the new thing in the block? Why is everything that I have could be explained with oxalate and nobody knows about this? And one of the reasons I think it's because we are changing the way we eat. It's, um, we're changing the way we eat. We have foods available year round that weren't available before. When I was a kid, you couldn't get in Mexico strawberries in December. You couldn't, you know, they had to be frozen or whatever. It was hard and they were expensive, you know, same with spinach. And now you have a lot of these foods that are becoming in the fashion, you know, available year round. And you also have a lot of foods that people were not used to eating or don't have the traditional way of preparing them because they are high in oxalate and they're being prepared in new novel ways. And people are saying, oh, this is such a great idea without realizing that there's an oxalate component in it. And then um, the other really big thing is that oxalates are addictive. And if anybody has eaten buckwheat pasta and you know it's not good, 
It's pasty. It doesn't have a good consistency. Doesn't pick up sauces very well. I was addicted to that stuff. You won't believe it. And, uh, and I realized that something was off because I knew that it wasn't good. But yet when it was like, what are we eating tonight? Mm, buckwheat pasta. <laughs> Which was really odd. So who's taking the food bit? <laughs> Oh, I'd be happy to talk about this one because I remember my entire diet being composed of high oxalate foods. I was eating dark chocolate. I was having spinach or beets or almonds every day. I was eating gluten-free. Like almost everything that we've got on this section for food was something that my family was consuming. And while chocolate, milk chocolate might be really yummy, for those of you who think that dark chocolate's really good, take about a three or four week break from that and then take a bite of it again. <laughs> Some of these things that we're, we're proposing with, I'm going to say, the current fashion in nutrition are things that are extremely high oxalate. And in many cases, these things are being proposed as good additions to our diet because they have high nutrients without any recognition of the amount of anti-nutrients and then some kind of a cost benefit between nutrient and anti-nutrient. If you look at things like chocolate, people talk about it being a great source of magnesium. Well, not if it's bound to oxalate, that is not a good deal. Um, almonds, I remember eating almond muffins. Oh, and with chocolate chips. Oh, and add some nuts and oh dear Lord. Um, and if I could have got spinach in there, I probably would have done that. And, you know, there could have been 500, 600 milligrams of oxalate in one of those muffins because they're not little either. They're big. Um, and so, you know, the healthier the food, it's almost like lately, it, the, the more likely it's high in, really high in oxalate. And I think the one that's driving me the craziest on our list of addictive oxalate foods here uh, would be chia seed pudding, chocolate chia seed pudding. Mm -hmm. um, chia, chia seeds are extraordinarily high in oxalate. You add chocolate, you, you add, and some people are saying, oh, make this extra good for you and help detox and we'll put turmeric in it too. And oh Lord, by the time they're done. Oh, and cinnamon, we need ground cinnamon in there as well. So um, the problem here is really that we're increasing oxalate uh, orders of magnitude, what would be normal if you were eating a seasonal diet, probably for your environment. Uh, we're not doing the traditional preparation like Patricia was talking about. So it's not seasonal. We don't do the traditional preparations. I mean, when I was a kid, um, mind you, that was in the last, like that was in the 1900s, I can say now. <laughs> <laughs> when I was a kid, um, when people ate spinach, they ate creamed spinach. So yeah. we were actually eating the food with the oxalate in it, but we were providing, you can't really say antidote, but sort of a modifier uh, to the food that would have protected us to some degree from the, the amount of oxalate in there. And we are not doing that kind of thing. So really fast, really big increases in oxalate. Um, and those things can certainly bring on symptoms. Lots of these exotic gluten-free substitutions. When I looked at TEF, that's another one of those ones like Chia, where it's astonishing how much oxalate's in there. Patricia talked about buckwheat. Of course, we have amaranth and quinoa and all these things. Quinoa is touted as high protein, but again, there's no, we're not doing traditional processing of quinoa before we eat it and high protein compared to what and how much toxins in there. So we really need to consider what our diet looks like in terms of these foods where we are really escalating our oxalate intake. Yeah, Patricia. Say, you know, we are not 
demonizing foods because that's I get that a lot. You know, it's like, oh, we don't demonize food. Everything, every food is good and whatever. I think uh, the fact that they're addictive is a really important bit in this equation because when you start yep. eating, you know, your little spinach salad with like the goat cheese on top and whatever, and you find it delicious when you're 15 and then all of a sudden you're eating it once a week and then it's twice a week and then it's every day. Every day. It was and really profound how quickly it took over my life. Yeah. It's uh, yeah. And it's something that we hear often. And in the, if you look at some of the historical record, you know, I've been, that's one of my pet peeves. I, I, you know, I get some of those old, recipe books from like old monasteries and things like that and when you see you know how many plants they planted in the garden to provide for the monks or where uh you know the the kinds of preparations that they had to go through you know with the different foods it's a very very different type of food than what we're having now even things like uh, soy, for example, you know, soy in the traditional manner, it's fermented, it's eaten just in tiny little amounts. You don't put half a kilo with some water and mix it and drink it. Well, and, and I would totally agree that even now, my family does eat a little bit of chocolate, but how do we eat it? Small amounts as a condiment, not as a main like ingredient. So think a coconut flour muffin that's got a few chocolate chips in it. Well, that's not going to kill you. Um, so it's it really is, and I think we've said this before too, about you know portion. It's about oxalate per serving. And if your serving size is small, you may be able to have some, but then it's you still have to think about why am I eating this? So with us, chocolate in my family still, chocolate's one of those things that wins out in the cost benefit analysis because people like it. Um, so we just eat it carefully. Um, a, a little bit of chocolate syrup on vanilla ice cream. Nobody's going to die doing that. Um, a little bit of chocolate um, chips in a, in a muffin but we're not sitting down and eating a chocolate bar. And, and so I would say, yeah, we don't want to demonize foods, but we don't want to give anybody the wrong idea about the appropriateness of the quantity of a food in your diet. And with some foods, and I'll use spinach as my, as my fall guy here, because I'm, I'm not a huge fan of it. <clears throat> I would never work hard at a, res a recipe for my family who's already low oxalate to find a way for us to have a little bit of spinach. It doesn't taste good enough. I don't like the texture of all that grit on my teeth. Like, so we would never, we would never fight for that. So I'll, I'll, I'll let, I'll let spinach be demonized, but but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll be happy to remediate chocolate. Well, there are some foods that, that simply pack a, a pretty powerful oxalate punch. Yeah. No I mean, if you, if you look at, at prickly pear, that's got a considerable amount of, of oxalate that can be quite toxic. Star fruit. Star fruit, yeah. You know, that's there have been plenty of studies, you know, of people eating too much star fruit and ending up in the hospital. And star fruits on our radar coming up. So it's, it's some pretty, pretty toxic stuff. Yeah. You know, as much as I hate to say it, plantains. Well, I was you very know, sad about I, that, but I'm not fighting to keep that in my diet either. <laughs> you know, I, I wish I could keep it in my diet, but I mean, even a small slice, but that's incredibly high. High oxalate, even in small amounts. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. So chia seed is another one like that. It's just, <clears throat> it's not worth it to fight to keep that in your. 
So as much as we have the issue with food of going too high in oxalate, then you could see the problem by decreasing oxalate, which is what you want to do. But as we've said many times before, not too fast, because if you come down too quickly, you can have, let's say the rapid revelation of the fact that you've got oxalate on board there somewhere and, and potentially fairly intense symptoms. And that's why fasting or major dietary changes are on our list here with food, not because of the addictiveness of the oxalate in this case, but because of how much damage, uh, not necessarily permanent, but how much uh, oxalate is getting that, as I say, second kick at the can as it's leaving. So while it's been in a cell, it may to some extent have been kind of sequestered from what it could do in your body. But once it's been released back into the blood stream, it's a whole new chance to kind of have some fun with you before it leaves. And, and yeah, go ahead, Carla. You may not realize that it's, you know, that it's happening. When I was pregnant with Ian, I was diagnosed with gestational diabetes. The first thing that the doctor did was send me to an endocrinologist who promptly put me on 50 grams of carbohydrates a day. I was probably, you know, 150, maybe 200, loved potatoes, you know, was, was doing high carb, going to, to 50 grams basically put me in dumping mode without really understanding that that I was dumping. You know, I had pain in my feet. You know, I was in the military at the time. I got to where I couldn't even wear my combat boots. I had to have tennis shoes. <laughs> my leg that I had broken as as a teenager and had pins inserted suddenly started acting up and I, I was a fairly unhappy camper for a, a number of weeks. What I thought at the time was that it was like carb flu because I had decreased, you know, carbs so quickly, but, you know, in, in retrospect, when I actually started the diet before my son, a lot of those things crept back when I went straight to low oxalate. So I was dumping and, and didn't even know it and pregnant. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and if you think about it, when people get sick and suddenly stop eating or when people have got um, a stomach flu of some kind, and might be throwing up for two or three days. And then for some reason, have a very hard time recovering they've probably just accidentally waltzed right into what happens when you have oxalate starting to, to dump into your bloodstream. Yeah. So shall we go on to drink? We have lots of fun things on our, on our list here. Yep. <laughs> do you want, do you want to have some fun Carla and start us off on this one? Well, uh, for me, the thing would have been the hot chocolate. You know, I, I was big on that. Chai, I love, love chai. I was doing the mushroom coffee. You know, uh, and chaga mushroom, we've started to learn, has a very high amount of, of oxalate. I wasn't into the green smoothies, thank God. You know, I wasn't a real big spinach, you know, spinach eater. I would have like a salad, you know, spinach salad here and there. But, you know, we're talking once a month, maybe once every couple of weeks. I just didn't do the whole green smoothies things. But, yeah, I was on board with that golden milk. And as as much chai as you could give me, I was dumping that stuff in my coffee. So, yep. you know. Yep, I hear you. I was, I was big on chai. I liked beet juice in retrospect <laughs> like 
And chaga mushroom is eye-wateringly high. So if you're watching this video and you are a fan of chaga mushroom, it is so high in oxalate, please start to reduce extremely slowly because there's no way for us to know exactly how much oxalates in any particular chaga product, but some of the numbers out there are quite frankly astonishing. Chaga might make just about anything else on our list so far look like an amateur. Yeah. Now, one of the things I want to point out is that um, people who are marketing food and are trying to go like, ooh, what's new? And, you know, what is trendy? And this and that. Um, they know that we like uh, to ignore what's always there and then to pay attention to what is new, right? I mean, that's just the way we are novelty yeah novelty we like novelty so a lot of times the new thing on the block may be one of these high oxalate foods that has an addictive quality and somebody's kind of figured out that oh man if i start marketing this people are going to buy it you know and so you need to be really careful about these new trend things that come around because, um, you know, we, we work very hard at testing foods in our project. And we're, we're trying to follow the trends, you know, and figure out we all, what, what's the new thing on the block uh, this month or this year. And, uh, but just be careful about that. Because if you start, if, if you think, oh, that's something new and I haven't tried it. And then you start eating it. And then suddenly you're like addicted to it. Then there's a possibility that that it is a high oxalate food and or it has some other quality to it that makes it addictive. So just be careful about that. Yeah, and the other thing is um, when it comes to some of these new and trendy things, if you are starting them up, let's say the celery juice craze that was really big for a while and you do it for a while and you feel really good, but then you start to notice the next time you have your big thing of celery juice first thing in the morning, that you don't feel as good afterwards. For me, that was one of the hallmarks of high oxalate foods that when I, or, or, or high oxalate drinks for that matter, when I first took them in, I felt really good after them. But eventually it was like, the good stuff kind of rubbed off and I would be having my next green smoothie or my next beet juice, Lord help me. And I didn't feel as good after having it. That's one of the things that I really think of as kind of a hallmark of oxalate is that, is that business of it seemed to work and now it doesn't. So another thing to kind of Keep in mind if you're if you're doing any of these. Oh, and by the way, in terms of popular drinks, black tea on this list is a, you know, is the is the baby bad guy in terms of everything else that you see there. Yeah. Um, while for a lot of people, black tea can really add up because maybe you're having four, five, six cups of tea a day. Um, you know, most of these other things are a lot higher in oxalate than black tea is. Okay, shall we tackle our last um, category, which is really kind of a big category, because we've got lots of things grouped in here. So this is, you know, other places where you could find oxalate or place uh, other things that you could be doing that help to produce oxalate, either because they degrade into oxalate, which we'll talk about with vitamin C, or because they um, are, are going to be metabolized into oxalate. So we have this non-dietary factors because these are things that you're taking that are not just things that you're eating in larger quantities. And we're going to include medications in here because some people can end up with some significant issues which may be related to medications that they've taken. Oh, and I forgot, I forgot the information on our 
um, Miralax. So I don't know if you want to actually speak to that one, Susan. It's not yeah, in the list, but I should add it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to add it so it'll be there permanently. Yeah, so. I'll add it in. In the meantime, if you want to, do you want to take well, off? Let me talk about the vitamin C a little bit. Sure. Um, you know, everybody thinks vitamin C is the best, best thing, thing since sliced bread. And a lot of the doctors believe in high dose vitamin C and might say, oh, well, you know, you're sick. You need to be taking this. And the problem with vitamin C is that when it is used, that's when it turns into oxalate. It's like it's the product of actually using vitamin C that converts um, in, into oxalate. And it doesn't even take an enzyme to do that. So it, it can even happen in a, a cup. You, you put the vitamin C in the cup and then uh, as the day goes along, more of it's going to turn into vitamin C. And you so mean that, an oxalate, right? I, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's okay. I'm it's the natural I, degradation, right? Am I am I correct in that, Susan? It's like the natural degradation for it's vitamin C. It's just a natural course that it takes. It's not the only one that's out there, but it's one of the what one of the ways it degrades. And so, for that reason, um, it is not rapid. And there were some studies on this, and they found out that half of it converts in about 14 or 15 days after you've taken it in. And so a lot of the doctors were taught that, you know, oh, well, not that much converts because they were only looking one day out, but they weren't looking at what was happening like two weeks later. And, and that's where it gets kind of tricky because, you know, once it's in your body, then it has the possibility of converting later into oxalate. Right, right. And that's why it's a bit tricky. And the reason we said 250 milligrams is not that there's some magic, you know, in getting lower than that. It's just that uh, as much as, you know, in some people, if you're sick, as much as 66% of your um, vitamin C can turn into oxalate. And so, of course, if you do the math, you know, what's two thirds of 250? It's a lot. Well, at two thirds of a thousand or 5,000 milligrams is even more. And that's not an unusual dose for people to be taking before they find out about the fact that they can end up with oxalate because it's degrading that way. Well, there really aren't any studies that are looking at really high doses. And so we don't know if the percentage stays the same or if it's a lower percentage. And so um, that's just unknown territory. But we do know that at lower doses, uh, quite a bit can convert. Yep. Yep. Um, uh, well, so do we want to handle turmeric, milk thistles? Yeah, I, I can handle the turmeric. The turmeric is... Um, you know, often touted as a health food. And the problem there is they don't know that it can turn into oxalate and so, or, or that it contains a lot of oxalate. And so um, uh, there is an extract that is made out of turmeric that is actually very similar, tastes the same, and um, uh, it's called curcumin. And... Um, you can buy that, you know, like at a health food store or something like that. And you can actually use it in food because it tastes pretty much the same. Absolutely. I make all anything that's got curry kind of spices in it now. I use bulk curcumin powder and it's perfect. Right. And so does somebody else want to handle some of the next ones? Sure. I can jump in and do milk thistle. Um, I was taking a lot of this before I came on board because I was having a lot of issues with digestion and um, bile production and things like that, that a lot of people can have. Um, and the thing about milk thistle is that here you are taking this herb that's supposed to support your liver and supposed to help support your system. And it's really high in oxalate. So if your problems are being caused by oxalate in the first place, milk <laughs> thistle puts you on kind of a hamster wheel where you're doing this because 
you're trying to deal with oxalate, you're bringing in more oxalate to try and deal with oxalate, but you're bringing in more oxalate. So this is one of those places where, um, again, if you buy at a health food store and get an extract of milk thistle, you'll do much better because you'll be able to get the important therapeutic aspect of the milk thistle herb, but without that extra oxalate. And this is really common with a lot of different um, herbal products where people are taking them, trying to obtain their therapeutic benefits, but there's a lot of oxalate on board in the, in the herb itself. So um, same kind of problem as with turmeric. What you want is something that leaves the oxalate behind and gives you the benefit that you're after. And the same thing would apply for slippery elm and the marshmallow root. Yep. I mean, those two are often used for gut health, but they're extremely high oxalate. And the so? best, the good alternatives are using extracts. Right. You know, so like Monique said, you get the benefit without the downside. Yeah. And um if we continue with the list, you know, the next ones is antibiotics and antifungals. And actually that is probably in my case, the reason why I ended up with an oxalate issue. But um, it's becoming more and more common that people get antibiotics for a number of things, including UTIs that are not UTIs. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> urinary tract infections or UTI. So, and that could be oxalate because of what you've been eating or that you are already trying to detox and your vitamin stores are getting lower. So you're starting to make it endogenously. It's coming out. It's, you know, it's giving you symptoms. And then people say, well, just take some antibiotics. And what happens is that our only defense really you know, on the, in the gut to get rid of these, um, of these oxalates are some specialized critters in our microbiome. So we have not only one, a lot of people talk about the oxalobacter forming genes, which is the specialist, you know, he's there because he was there always to help because we were eating the cream spinach in, you know, throughout history. And we were eating, you know, some chocolate or some beans or some cactus or whatever. So there was already a population of specialized um, flora, so to speak, that, uh, that would take care of it. What happens is that it's very, very sensitive to a lot of antibiotics. So you take an antibiotic to kill an amoeba or a sore throat or something, but actually what you are also killing is something that is vitally important for your handling of oxalates. And since it's an anaerobe, that means that it doesn't like to be in an oxygen rich environment, then it's not so easy to, you know, to repopulate. And, um, it's uh, it's kind of like a catch-22. You're starting to take all these antibiotics maybe a long time ago and before you could eat all these foods without any issue. And uh, you start taking antibiotics, you start having the inflammation, you start having, you know, different, um, different reactions, you're out of balance. And then other microorganisms try to eat the, you know, try to compensate for the lack of that particular uh, microorganism, which is the oxalobacter. So if you have in your uh, stool analysis, things that come back like zero acidophilos, zero bifidos, zero of this, and you're like, how I'm eating yogurt and I'm doing this and I'm doing whatever, you know, and I'm trying to take my probiotics and it's coming out as zero is because whatever it is that it's in there, it's put on the front line to try to eat the stuff up. 
So um, just be aware that antibiotics is, you know, are have effects that go way further than anything that we've ever thought possible before. Susan and I went to a conference in Madrid and it was a conference of the best gastroenterologists in the world. It was a really big deal. And uh, on the last day, there was like a big panel and we could ask questions of the panel. So we've been there for three days. I've been, I've been listening to all of these things. And in the autism world, there was a lot of antibiotics being given. And in this conference, everything I heard was how bad antibiotics were for anything that lived in the gut. So I raised my hand and I say, uh, could you please tell me as a panel, when would it be justified to give an antibiotic? And, um, and it was really funny because they actually just kind of like scooch their chairs out and they make like a little circle and start talking about it. And they said in, you know, the official result of this panel is that antibiotics should be given when you have a, a very serious infection. They were talking about sepsis. They were talking about, you know, risk of death. And when, and I was coming from a world when kids were taking antibiotics on a regular basis during years. And uh, I myself took antibiotics orally and in a shot in the muscle every four, what was it? The, I started at 12 and I ended up, I stopped at 27. So it was 15 years of daily antibiotics. And many different people have these sorts of extreme use of antibiotics that will have an effect and will have an effect also probably on the next generations. Because my kids had very poor population of, you know, microbiome. So same with um, antifungals. You know, you say, oh, this is going to kill this particular organism. No, you're putting in a killing agent that it's going to be attacking many different families of all of these. So I think... Um, if we talk about some of the things that could bring you into becoming a TLO list mate, it's probably antibiotics and antifungals. And one oh, thing yeah, to and the work it makes for your body too, not just well, for your microbiome and the things that it kills off there, but the stress for your system as your system copes with whatever it's doing. Your, your well, turn. <laughs> The other thing to consider as well is that this doesn't just apply to prescription antibiotics right. and, and yeah. antifungals. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, the, the stuff that you get over the counter at your health store. Or, or OTC at your, at your pharmacy, because some antifungals are OTC for, for certain applications, right? At the pharmacy. Well, yeah, but they, they may not be as, as potent as what you're getting prescription strength, but they're not benign either. Right. You know, we used grapefruit seed extract for, you know, for yeast. That's still causing, you know, that's still going to cause oxidative stress. You know, the, the natural antimicrobials aren't going to to discriminate between what's good flora versus what's bad flora. It's and so many people have that misunderstanding that somehow certain kinds of antibiotics or antifungals are somehow benign. Oh, that'll only kill off the bad guys. Well, it oh, yeah. yeah. How does how does that chemical know what's a bad guy and what's a good guy it's just it doesn't work that way uh, i also want to just give a little bit of historical context to this because i got to thinking about this when i was 
looking at when um, antibiotics were discovered, which was basically the, in the 1930s was when they started doing clinical trials and things like that. But we had a world war going on. And so that wasn't really a time to change a lot of anything. And so basically antibiotics were then introduced after World War II was over. And so I don't know, I mean, I'm older than everybody else, all, all of our other wizards, but my mother and father served in World War II. And so they were, that means they were already grown up. So my parents never had an antibiotic until they were adults. Think about that. That is not very long ago. And so a lot of people have these questions like, oh my gosh, I mean, my family's eaten so-and-so for generations upon generations and that sort of thing. And my grandmother ate this and my grandmother had the recipe for this or that. And, and the deal is that that was before antibiotics were introduced. And so antibiotics changed which microbes we had in our gut and what they could do with toxic things like oxalate but certainly oxalate's not the only toxic thing that's in plant food. And, um, and this is why it just kind of changed the whole relationship that human beings had had to the microbial yeah, yes. kingdom. Yeah, that's a very good point. And, and something else I wanted to add is that uh, very recently, there was a new article that was looking at fluconazole, which is one of the major antifungals that are uh, used by a lot of doctors. And um, what it found was that it didn't just um, act on fungus, but it made huge changes to the bacterial kingdoms too. I mean, all of those different species. And so it's just like what we're learning right now, because we have the technique to learn it, is that um, these medicines that became popular, you know, uh, 40 or 50 years ago, we now have the technology to understand what they did. And there, there was a downside that we just didn't know. So we yeah. only have about five minutes left. Can we squeeze in a little talk about Miralax and uh, endogenous well, I'd love to talk about Miralax because um, when I first heard about Miralax, the two, two ways, I had a neighbor whose son started taking it and, and um, she told me about it and I looked at the bottle and I said, this is polyethylene glycol. And I had stopped, I was in graduate school at the time and we were studying how with polyethylene glycol, you can take two uh, cells from two different organisms and put them in a petri dish and add the polyethylene glycol and their membranes will merge and there will be gene swapping that takes that goes on and so that's what I had studied in graduate school and I was thinking about oh my gosh you stick that down in your gut and then you have you know thousands of different species do you want all this gene swapping to be going on and that did not seem like a very good idea. And so I then looked at the chemical, the, um, the cl clinical trials for Miralax, and I have never seen anything that looked so um, improperly done. <laughs> and um, I, I was just shocked at that. And um, and that was when it was a prescription. And then a suddenly, uh, I don't know how many years ago was it, ladies, maybe five or six years, that they it's made like it over the counter. Taking it. Yeah, it, it over the counter and everybody was taking it. And it was recommended for all kinds of things, colonoscopy prep and yeah. Right. And, and the thing is, you can actually get a lot of the same benefit just from taking magnesium because magnesium will draw water into your, and, and that's, you know, if you, if I, when I looked at the clinical trials, the only thing they looked at in the clinical trials was whether it made the stool absorb more water. That was it. And they didn't look at any of the other qualities that they knew about polyethylene glycol and what it would do. 
And so I just recommend to you, if somebody tells you to take it, just really uh, think about this because I was at this conference when one of the doctors was first, you know, talking about using it and he was recommending it. And there was a rebellion in the, in the, in the audience because there were so many parents who had used it and it caused just a disaster with their children and, and their behavior. And so just please be careful about Miralax. Yes, it does. When it uh, metabolizes, also it metabolizes into oxalate as well. So yeah. we have we have a product that is doing several things that we don't want done. So I think that's that's the that's the thing. And I think it was a very broad look at many things that are considered by many people kind of like sacred cows, you know, spinach is this wonderful food and turmeric is fantastic and, and nuts are good for you. So I, we, we know, and we are very much aware that what we're talking about here is not common use is not what you hear outside on the internet. It's but a paradigm shift. This is a paradigm shift compared to the kinds of recommendations you'll get from your garden variety nutritionist out there, or even from most medical practitioners. Um, we, we realize that we're asking you to come with us to to learn a different way of looking at food, but uh, we're also hoping that it's going to mean that you're healthier, that you're wiser, that you eat better, that you start to think about how food does right by you as well as how it might be doing wrong by you. So that you're not just treating every food as an equal player on a playing field. Some of them are better for you than others. And just be very careful about any time you start eating a new food and then you crave it. Because that's not really the relationship we're supposed to have with food. It's not, not, not something that we like, I can't live without it. You know, and um, I remember once my daughter came to visit me, she's grown up. So, um, and she was going to make some cookies and she was going to put some chocolate chips. I think this was before our, pro our project started or something. But anyway, so she left it in the refrigerator and then I started going in there and I would just take one or two. And then the next day it would take three or four. And then the next day it would take five or six. And pretty soon I found that I was just making a beeline to that refrigerator to eat those chocolate chips. So anytime anything does that to you, just be aware of it and say, you know, this is probably not okay. I remember my grandmother, my one grandmother saying, eat to live, don't live to eat. So if your food is making you feel like you live to eat, then maybe we have to think about it in terms of the food should be your fuel, but it should also... The, the thing I think which is really paradigm shifting is when you think about food as your body's replacement parts. You wouldn't buy a car with adulterated steel. You don't want to build a body full of toxins. <laughs> you want to build good. This is the body I'm going to live in next week, next year, hopefully a decade from now, right? I want it to be built with the right materials, the way that makes it the healthiest and the best. And I, I, I keep reminding people in my regular life, you are an independently mobile production facility, manufacturing facility uh, with emotions and other good things. But <laughs> essentially, this body, that's what it does. It's independently mobile and it's a production facility. It's going to build your bones, your skin, your hair, your organs. You want all that stuff to be built right. This is the this is the right way to build back better. <laughs> I 
And uh, the other, just to close, the last thing that I would like to say is that another one of the comments that we get, um, especially from people that are not yet part of the group, is that I've eaten it all this time and it's never been a problem. And that is the fact that oxalate accumulates. And uh, so you might be okay when you're 15, when you're 16, you might be not perfect, but you're thinking, oh, okay, I'm 30, it's okay, the age is coming and whatever. By the time you're 45, 50 or 60, then you're starting to get all sorts of little boo-boos and you don't know where they're coming from. So if you start to recognize yourself in some of the things that we talk about, just remember that because it is accumulating and because it's going to be dumped out of your system in relationship with concentration, you want to do it slowly. You do not want to jerk your body around, especially when you're not feeling well and you already are 50 something and, uh, and say, okay, well, now I'm going to fast or now I'm going to do, you know, no oxalate, whatever. And then I just want to get rid of it tomorrow because you have been probably collecting it for the past, name the years. You probably had your first spinach, you know, with the little pots in the supermarket. So, you know, this stuff accumulates. And even if you haven't had trouble before, that unfortunately does not warrant you that you will not have trouble with it later. And um, with that, I guess we're going to be closing the discussion. If you want more information, we have the Trying Low Oxalates group in Facebook. We have the Trying Low Oxalates group in Groups IO. And we have our YouTube channel, which is at Wizards Box. And uh, but thank you for much for thank you so much for coming. And we will see you next time.